Welcome to the Moore Institute at the National University of Ireland, Galway. I'm the director of the Institute, Daniel Carey. We are delighted to be hosting this session uh, tonight on making research meaningful for multilingual parents. Uh, this session forms part of a series that is convened by the Center for Applied Linguistics and Multilingualism, CALM, uh, at NUI Galway that forms part of the Moore Institute. Uh, that center is directed by Laura McLaughlin and John Walsh. And uh, John is going to be hosting, moderating this evening. So John, over to you. Thanks very much, Dan, and good evening, everybody, and welcome to CAM, the Center for Applied Languages and Multilingualism. And I'm delighted to uh, announce the first a slightly delayed, belated uh, seminar in our series for this academic year, obviously because of the circumstances we had to cancel everything in the spring and resume the organization after the uh, beginning of semester, the, the delayed beginning of semester. So we have five um, talks for you in the course of this academic year, and they'll all be advertised on our website, nuigalway.ie forward slash cam, and on our social media channels as well. And we're very grateful to the Moore Institute and to David Kelly and Dan Carey for their assistance with hosting this and our other events this evening. So our first speaker, as Dan said, is Mary Pat O'Malley, Dr. Mary Pat O'Malley, who's a lecturer in speech and language therapy here in NUI Galway and a member of CAM, the Center for Applied Linguistics and Multilingualism. So Mary Pat has been working with uh, families for 25 years um, in her capacity as a speech and language therapist and lecturer. She's passionate about supporting by multilingual families where there are concerns about the children's speech and language development. And she uses evidence-based strategies through her blog, Talk Nua, and you can find that at talknua.com. Mary Pat has recently set up a Facebook group called Becoming Bilingual with the multilingual speech and language therapist, Nadja Herkner. And she's involved in a range of research projects aimed at improving speech and language therapy services for multilingual families. So I'm delighted to welcome Mary Pat to our seminar this evening. Thanks a million, John, and hello everyone, uh, Dave Galair, and I'm delighted to be here, um, and thank you so much for the invitation. So I'm just going to share the screen now, so one second. Okay, so I have bad news and good news. So the bad news is I do have slides, but the good news is I don't have a lot of them. Um, so the whole point about making research accessible to families and multilingual families in particular is about a conversational tone. So the presentation is going to be conversational in nature to match the kind of tone of talknewwood.com. That's the name of the website there. And I'd be delighted if people want to visit it and sign up to uh, receive my um, articles, which I uh, post every two weeks. So the first thing we're going to do is I am going to show you a series of pictures and I'm going to ask you a question. And what I want you to do is when you're trying to answer the question is I would like you to reflect on the feelings that you're having when you're trying to answer the question um, and what are you kind of saying to yourself. And once I've gone through the three, the three pictures, um, I want you to put that feedback in the chat and John will relay the chat to me and we'll talk about that. OK, so first one, what's that? What's that? Now, I don't want you to answer the question as in give me the answer, what you think it is. It's about the feeling if you're not sure what it is and what's going through your mind. OK, and the last one, what's that? OK, so, John, if there are comments there about the again, the feeling that that kind of question triggers when you're not sure what the answer is. OK, so a variety of comments here. Um, some people are saying what they thought the thing was and others are giving a more emotive kind of answer. So we have frog, a frog's eye, yuck, crocodile eye, need glasses, frog, peace, serenity, nighttime, dull, boring prison, uncertainty, frustration that I didn't know any of them, scrutiny, that's for number one. 
Mm. The last one makes me think of Casa Baglio. Two, peacefulness, and three, boring. Apprehension, uncertainty, and anxiety. And finally, uncomfortable seeing the last one fenced in. So I don't know, can you make sense of that, Mary Pat? Oh, absolutely. That is fantastic. Because... Oh, we've, one more. We've, we've one more. Apologies. The third one is challenging because the other two are nature images. I wanted to make it into a nature poster, a photo. <laughs> and another one in relation to picture three, dull, boring prison. Oh, that is fantastic. Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, engaging and contributing. So the point of that really is about the feeling of people mentioned uncertainty, anxiety, scrutiny. And the point is that often parents of multilingual children where there is a concern about the child speech and language development experience those sensations, uh, particularly when they receive, let's say, advice from professionals to drop a language because it's confusing or doing harm. They're told it's doing harm to the child or they have been told to drop a language. They've been told that their, their child shouldn't go to an, a Nian, I will say, because they have a language delay. So that's the sensation that parents can experience in response to the myths around um, speech and language development in multilingual children. Now we're going to go back through the same three pictures. This time I'm going to tell you what the answer is. And I want you to put in the chat the feeling you have when you get the answer. So this is a Vietnamese mossy frog. This is the phases of a solar eclipse where the photos are stacked to give that effect. And these are the roof tiles on a Tibetan monastery. OK, so Mary Pat, there's a few, <laughs> a few interesting ones coming in here. Okay. I said I said, wow, at number one, we have aspiration in regard to the moon photos. Number three, surprised. Um, frog, the person says, so what? The photo didn't interest me. Another person says, even more confused. <laughs> Another person says, the last one surprised me. Another comment, symmetry for the last one. Dima Adair de Navine, disappointment. Certainty, and I feel a bit silly that I didn't get any of them, says somebody else. Another comment, interesting, the last one I thought was barbed wire. Another comment in relation to the moon one, still feeling peace and serenity. Another comment, wouldn't have guessed the last. And another comment, sort of happy because I got close. Oh, that's wonderful. Again, thanks a million. That's great because the point of that exercise is really that feeling of when you get the answer and the penny drops of, oh, so that's what it is. And again, my kind of aim with the talknewa.com project is to take parents of multilingual children from state A of uncertainty, confusion, un feeling under scrutiny, not sure, to the state B of, okay, I get it now, or Okay, I understand that. And I'm hoping they don't have the experience of DMA. Um, uh, but that's kind of the point of that exercise. So it was with that view, with that kind of idea in mind that I set up the project because when I looked around at the kind of landscape around what avail uh, information was available publicly for parents of multilingual children, particularly with speech and language difficulties, there are loads of groups, there's lots of parental support in terms of anecdotal experience, and that's really important. But what struck me was like the absence of, of information that's based on science and the research. So I thought about how could I basically make a contribution um, and make a difference uh, that fit in with my own values and I suppose the work that I'm doing and I thought then that I would start the blog in order to kind of bust those myths and so what I do is I publish every two weeks ideally I don't always manage the two weeks because you know I, there's loads going on um, and everything I write is basically like a mini rapid review of the research so I look at questions parents have I think about things that I think are interesting like let's say what happens to language in children who are late to talk what about children who are born prematurely and are multilingual? And I try to answer those questions and answer parents' questions. And at the end of each post, I have a section which is called uh, what I read, so you don't have to. And that's where I put the names of all the articles so that people can see this is 
you know, coming from the research. So what was involved in terms of, I write in terms of research, so I write journal articles, I'm familiar with academic writing, and we know that academic writing is all about, you know, using complex um, grammar, uh, technical terminology, uh, exploring uh, abstract, uh, complex concepts, not using the first person, using the passive voice, um, not being subjective. So writing for disseminating information to the public and making it accessible and interesting is a whole other ballgame. So now I want to know if there were any Seinfeld fans in the audience. And John, you um, might let me know. No, no comments yet, Mary Pat. Would you mind maybe unsharing your screen unless you have slides now, just so we can see you? Oh, I do have slides. Oh, well, are you going to continue with another slide now? Yeah, I'm continuing okay, with slides. Apologies. Yeah, That's apologies. fine, no problem. Uh, not really uh, is one comment in response okay. to your question. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, yes, yes, says Dan Carey. Oh, good, Dan Carey. Okay. So Seinfeld, basically, if, if you're not familiar with it, is an American sitcom. And one of my favorite episodes is called The Opposite. And in the this episode, George, who's one of the main characters, has just has kind of come to the conclusion he's down in his luck, things aren't going according to plan, and he decides to do the opposite of everything he has usually done. So the thinking is if every instinct you have is wrong, then the opposite would have to be right. Um, and there's a scene where uh, George, this is George, um, is in the diner and Elaine, one of the other characters, says to him, that woman over there has been looking at you. And in a complete turnabout from what he would usually do, George goes over to her and says, my name is George, I'm unemployed and I live with my parents. And he's expecting, of course, it's going to go. Um, and he said something rude there. It's not going to go as he expected. And she turns around and says, I'm Victoria, hi. So the opposite worked for him. And basically with the writing of articles for um, public consumption, it's the opposite of academic writing. So in academic writing, as I said, it's you know formal, et cetera. You couldn't end a sentence with a preposition or begin a sentence with and or but or have incomplete sentences. But in um, conversational copywriting, um, you can do all of those things. So it's quite liberating. Um, it can, it's challenging as well because I'm trying to think of like headlines that will grab people's attention and keep them reading because we know there's so much noise out there that the thing has to like stand out. So there are, I have obviously lots of hits and misses. So what I did then to try and get the hang of this writing um, for families was I did an online course on writing copy by Marie Forleo, who's an American online entrepreneur. Um, and it's about writing for sales, but the principles again are the same because I'm selling like an idea or I'm selling a point of view. So I want to make it interesting and engaging for the audience. So what that looks like then is that you write with one person in mind. So you visualize one person they talk about even having like a photograph in front of you of the person you are communicating with and you write to that person you can begin a sentence in any way you like you can leave the sentence incomplete um, you can include stories of your own experience um, the idea as well is that there's a focus on what is the pain point for the person who's reading what's the thing that's worrying them or that keeps them up at night and how you can kind of provide information to help solve that problem. So um, that's kind of the tone. And then at the end of the article, there's a call to action. So you want the person maybe to leave a comment or to share the blog post or whatever. Um, so that's kind of the style of getting the hang of this conversational um, style of interacting. And as I say, like sometimes I think I've got a great headline and nobody reads it. And then sometimes I have a headline and I think it's only all right. Um, and lots of people read it. So you don't know kind of how it's going to go. So as I say, there's articles every two weeks. And then on the site as well, I have like a free, it's a free stuff page. Um, so I have to say, I really love the creativity of writing as you're talking. Sorry, before I go on to that, there's also the kind of the, the, the experience of finding your voice and do I sound like myself when I am writing so when the person is reading it will it sound like I'm actually speaking to them 
and I've had some feedback like from people who know me to say oh yeah definitely sounds like you so I'm going well that's good um so in the free stuff uh tab then I have a series of ebooks that I've started so the first one is for parents where the child has autism and can they become multilingual the answer is yes um not necessarily fluent but it, the idea really my kind of philosophical background is that if a person needs two or more languages to communicate and to uh, participate in all activities and contexts in their lives, then that's what they need. And that's where speech and language therapy must begin. Um, I have another one on um, for parents rather of children with Down syndrome and can they learn two or more languages? And it's again, rapid reviews, but written in a way to empower parents. Um, two other freebies that are up there are um, an ebook with 26, I think, different ways to help support the home language from a speech and language therapy, um, rich interaction kind of point of view. And then um, I have one on how to read together in terms of the, the nuts and bolts of the interaction that benefits language development. I don't go anywhere near things like, you know, family language planning or what language to speak when you're out and about. Um, I don't see that with, as being within kind of my um, remit. OK, so along the way, there have been some pleasant and unpleasant surprises. So we're going to start with the positive and the pleasant surprises. Um, so one pleasant surprise was that I started off with parents in mind as my audience. And then, as it turns out, speech and language therapists started reading the material and they can use the, the blog posts as uh, continuing professional development points because it's evidence based and drawing from the literature. So I have now an SLT audience and I'm really delighted about that. Um, other pleasant surprises are things like being invited to post on other people's uh, blogs and sites because that then obviously um, makes Talk Nua more visible to a wider audience. Um, in 2018, then I won a Lyrgus um, Department of Skill Education and Skills Award for it's a language label, um, and that was for creating awareness and challenging perceptions. So I was delighted, obviously, to get that. And they were particularly um, impressed with the focus on supporting families, home languages. Then myself and Riona Nureel from the Irish department here in NUI Galway and two speech therapy students um, got funding from the NUI Galway Explore project to create, the project is called Let's Get Talking, Be Misha Kind. Um, and we have developed a, a leaflet that's available on talknua.com for free um, in Irish, English, uh, Finnish, Russian, Polish, Spanish and French. Um, and I was delighted one day to be in a speech and language therapy clinic and see it up on the notice board and to get feedback from uh, parents who have used the leaflet, um, speech and language therapists as far as away as Australia who have given the leaflet to parents. Um, I gave the leaflet to public health nurses in training. Um, so that's, I'm really like delighted with that. Um, there's a plan then to make some videos of the leaflets to, for people who struggle with literacy um, and also who prefer to watch something and listen rather than, than read. Uh, then RTE Brainstorm in January. I wrote, so RTE Brainstorm is a forum for academics to write again for the general public. So I wrote a piece for them on bilingual babies' brains and how they handle input in different languages. And the day it was released, it was the most read post of the day. And these are, the again, the pleasant surprises. It feels to me like there's no... I can't predict what's going to be a hit and what's going to be a miss. So I was delighted with that. And then um, there were two short videos made on foot of that um, article. And between Facebook and Twitter, I think it reached something like between 30 and 40,000 people. So again, I was clearly thrilled about that. Um, then recently I did an interview with a, a YouTube channel called Raising Multilinguals Live and that's where they interview various people um, who are in the area of working with multilingual families. And I spoke about early language delay and late talking in multilingual children and the role of speech and language therapy um, when working with these children. Uh, and then the last one uh, in terms of the pleasant surprises is an Erasmus project called Peach, which is about promoting um, Europe's cultural and linguistic heritage. And we've just released a guide that I co-authored with other participants called Raising, How to Raise a Bilingual Child. And it's available for free on the, their website and it will be available in the 24 languages of the European Union. 
and there's also we've curated kind of a selection of resources i did the ones for irish um it's just a small selection of resources and for children of different ages and for parents and people can go in and actually upload links to resources that they know um and again um, this is to support um home languages across the european union so like I started the blog in 2016, when I look back at some of the stuff I wrote then, I go, oh dear God, I'm mortified. <laughs> um, so there's that as well. You just have to come overcome the discomfort of like trying something new and going, I'm not really sure, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. The unpleasant surprises. So one of the unpleasant surprises is when things nobody kind of comments or, you know, you think it's just a bit of a lead balloon that's a bit dispiriting. Um, thousands of spam comments on the website selling everything imaginable um, and I think as well I don't know enough really about you know the online world in terms of the patterns of people let's say reading something and but not commenting or not liking or sharing so it's hard sometimes to interpret for me anyway where the thing is going and then probably the most distressing and unanticipated um, unpleasant surprise was harassment online that started in 2016 and has well i'm afraid to say it seems to have calmed down now um but this was through the face i have a facebook page so it was through that it was comments on the website um contacting other people that i had guest posted for and saying unpleasant things about me writing to my colleagues in the university so that was definitely i never thought that would happen and that was very difficult but thankfully, um, the pleasant surprises far outweighed the unpleasant ones. So in terms of where am I going next, um, I want to finish the ebook series. So I would like to, I want to do an ebook for parents where children have a diagnosis of developmental language disorder um, and are raising multilingual children and for uh, children or parents of children who are deaf or hearing impaired um, and looking at the literature for, the, for those parents. I have a book almost ready to go on multilingual speech and language development, which would be of use to parents, but also to clinicians, because again, it's all based on the literature. And then myself and Nadia Herkner, that was the other pleasant surprise, who is a speech and language therapist based in Milan, have set up our biling Becoming Bilingual Facebook group, which is for uh, supporting parents of multilingual children with speech and language difficulties. And we want to kind of continue to grow that and find out, you know, what do parents want and how can we help them? So that's the whistle top stop tour through the story of, you know, Talk Nua and where it started and um what's involved so i hope you found it interesting and i really appreciate you taking the time at the end of a busy day busy weeks um for showing up to listen thanks very much indeed mary pat and um that was uh, very interesting indeed and uh i suppose we can take questions there's plenty of time for questions which is great there's no rush um and um if people want to put on their microphones, that's OK. Or if people want to drop a question in the chat, that's OK, too. Um, or if people even want to turn on their cameras, whatever method is the best. I'm here monitoring the chat. There is one question uh, so far, uh, Mary Pat. Uh, is there evidence that certain languages are more difficult to combine for children? Oh, I should write these down for ideas for blog posts. That's a great question. Hold on one second. Um, I, and you know what? The honest answer is, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think there is evidence around if languages are from different typological families. So let's say if you're learning um, English and Mandarin, for instance, that they can certainly kind of interact in ways. I see I'm I don't know enough about it to answer it, really. And my inclination is that we are wired to acquire languages. And if more people in the world speak at least two languages or more, then that's no, you know, that's typical development. And that there is such individual variation in each individual situation, you know, you have that's one of the factors, obviously, is how closely related the languages are or not to each other. The amount of exposure, the quality of the exposure, the status of the language in the society, the opportunities to use it, 
the person's individual motivation. So it is a complex picture. Um, so we'll say from the speech and language therapy point of view, I would be looking at, okay, what are the languages involved and how are they different or similar in relation to the speech sounds, the grammar, for instance, the like social rules of communication. So things like eye contact and turn taking and, you know, that kind of thing. So that's the best I can say in relation to that. There might be somebody else in the audience who knows a lot more about uh, that aspect of kind of linguistics than I do. Okay, very good. So are there any other questions? Does anybody want to come in on the microphone or put a question into the chat? We don't have any other questions in the chat for the moment. And that I can see. Yeah, anyway uh, thank you. That very, very interesting. Thanks. Uh, now, I was just wondering, um, what are the main worries of uh, parents um, uh, or bilingual uh, or multilingual children? Uh, I remember myself, I mean, I, my children were uh, bilingual and my grandchildren are trilingual now. And um, I, I always remember comments from people telling me, oh, you shouldn't be speaking to them in two languages because, uh, you know, that will delay their learning. That didn't happen at all. So that was, but that's a long time ago now. My children are well grown up now. So I wonder if it's the same now or if there are different worries. I think, unfortunately, Lara, it's that myth is still out there. And like, I am stunned at the number of like scenarios I come across from parents on Facebook where they are concerned that their child is slow to talk and they have been told by a healthcare professional. And this is a direct quote from a parent. You do know you're harming your child by speaking two more two languages to them. This is like 2020. So like, unfortunately, it's still you know, I don't obviously have figures in terms of how prevalent it is, but it's still happening. I've had, you know, reports from parents where their child is slow to talk or and they want to send them to the NINRA and they've been told by a speech and language therapist, no, they can't go to the NINRA because they have a language today. So unfortunately, it's still out there. So I think the worries are things like, is it causing confusion? Am I causing them harm? Can they learn the two? Um, are we doing the right thing? Um, is let's say the speaking two languages are more causing the speech and language difficulties. <clears throat> Should we drop a language? Would we be better off to focus on the community language? Um, so the question, I think, you know, the worries and the are uh, similar and the myths, unfortunately, are still there. But actually, I should say I do have a blog post um, that I wrote together with Professor Brian Goldstein, who is um, a speech and language therapy professor in the States, um, giving parents, like, I can't remember how many, but there might be like 12, like, things to do, let's say, when the uh, health professional or the educator says to you, you know, you're confusing them by speaking two languages or more. And we've ranged them from, like, to fit in with people, because everyone has a different style of, like, asserting themselves, or, you know, it's difficult to assert yourself in relation to the professional or the expert. Uh, ranging from kind of silence, ignoring it to, you know, gradually increasingly assertive <laughs> ways to push back against, you know, what's not best practice and is not backed up by any scientific evidence. Okay, yeah. very good. So a couple of, okay, thanks. So just a couple of comments coming in here and there's two questions. I'll, I'll come to those two people now. Just first of all, a comment. Um, Thank you so much. It just goes to show that your voice is needed out there when you had such a vitriolic reaction from the ignorant out there. So sorry you had to experience such upset. And oh we have um, a question now, and then I'll come back to the next comment in the chat. So we have two questions. I don't think I'm supposed to say names because of GDPR, but um, okay. uh, I'm not sure about that. But um, on here, then a hard cast. And then will go again. Oh, John. Uh, no, that's fine. I don't mind my name being mentioned, but uh, Mary, just uh, thankfully, uh, as somebody's just said, you are a breath, like a breath of fresh air. Um, I'm involved, just just brief, very, very brief. Uh, I'm involved with the schools. I think I met you before, actually, but I think I'm involved with the Gaeltach, new Gaeltach policy, the whole immersion program for schools. Oh, yes, we met, I met you at the launch of CAM that's in right, January. Yeah, right, the yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Absolutely. Well, work has changed an awful lot since then, but there you go. But uh, I suppose I'm coming from uh, the background of all the Gaelic theories in the country where, unfortunately, we're still at that stage where we're talking about the um, the whole harm one language does to another harm, etc. In certain areas, in certain, certain, it has to be got better, but we certainly do need, we need input like yourselves with the parents. But I still think the last point that was raised by Laura is, is, is huge. And I'm just wondering, I suppose, 
who's informing the people that should be informed, who's um, uh, informing the health professionals, the speech and language professionals, all of these, because I've come up against this where obviously based on my very, very limited research uh, compared to yours, but at the same time, I, I, have, I have met with parents, I've met with a group of parents right around every Gaelic mm -hmm. in the country, uh, but I have always been stood down by people coming with this kind of knowledge or informed discussion from health professionals who just tell them like, no, if you, if you, if the one thing that you can do to help your child who has a language need or who has a learning need is to get them out of that school. And I've had cases where schools in a Gaeltacht area didn't join the scheme, so they don't get recognition as a Gaeltacht school because of this issue. The fact that there was a, a cohort of parents who felt, and I don't blame the parents here, this is not blame parents, but they came with this information. And sometimes for somebody, like myself who's just a primary teacher, kind of up against this, it, it is very hard to try to kind of push back this, not even push back, but I suppose just kind of make them look at the the rest, the other side of the story. And I'm just wondering, I suppose my last, sorry, my long question is, like, is there anybody out there who's informing the professionals so that we're okay. all trying to get some, some sort of pay, same page. But I appreciate your, your work with parents. I really do. And I'm certainly going to be something that I would love to talk to you about again, maybe incorporating more girls parents into this. Into this. Oh, I love that, Rihal. I really love that. So to answer your question, like there's good news. So basically in relation to the speech and language therapists, like I started teaching them in first year and our the first session I have with first years, we talk about things like, you know, is an accent a problem and uh, we talk about multilingual children so I'm beginning the brainwashing from day one when they come in um, and I teach them throughout the four years around how to assess multilingual children um, to develop cultural competence language intervention and the bilingual focus you know and we talk about like you know the myths and uh, share the evidence with them so that's one thing so a change is happening slowly because I say to them well when you're out there in clinical practice you will not be doing the, you know, telling people to stop speaking a, uh, their home language or whatever. So, you know, change, of, it does take time. So that's one positive, right? Um, and then the other thing is there is a group of speech and language therapists called NERTH and myself and Stasha, who's another lecturer yeah. in speech and language therapy, are involved with um, those therapists in developing kind of assessment materials, Ask Oelga. Um, so at the moment, like, and yeah, like there's a thing called implementation science, you know, and how long it takes for research to filter down into practice. Yes. Um, and there are things that people can do already to develop like a culturally sensitive and, you know, linguistically sensitive uh, intervention or assessment and intervention. So we are working with those people as well. But it's, a, yeah, there is a kind of a PR problem. And as, as you say, getting in front of larger audiences, there's Kira O'Toole in UCC That's right, has also yeah. done work, you know, as well. So I think it's like we just have to keep chipping away at it. And as I say, there are speech and language therapists reading um, the blog. I'm in touch with the Irish Association of Speech and Language Therapists about doing some training for therapists and just kind of working out like the logistics. I do a module on cultural and linguistic diversity in health and education as part of an MSc and we have speech and language therapists on that as well. Um, so, you know, chip, chip, chip. But there's yeah, no absolutely. like, that, yeah. yeah, like there's no kind of, how would I say, like, organized kind of um what am i trying to say you know kind of approach i'm this is what i'm doing do you know what i mean yeah. i know i realize that i i appreciate that and as i said certainly you know any of that kind of work or any of that kind of advice or the you you know the the site or anything like that Certainly in 2017, when I when I started this, going around talking to parents in every day, if I had all of this information, it certainly would have helped me an awful lot because you're sometimes in the dark yourself as, as a teacher like that you that you talk. But it's certainly it is certainly a start. And I, I, I'm glad to see that because um, and I think parents are to be to give it credit to them. A lot of parents are making the research themselves now, looking into the research themselves. But I think at the same time, there is this kind of maybe inner feeling that I'm just a parent and this health professional is com I'm coming up against that and it takes a bit of oh you hit the nail on the head yeah. Michal. like it's very difficult like when you are a parent and you are concerned and you go and you see the expert and we project kind of expectations onto the expert and I'm from my own experience I am blown away by the tendency of 
some people to make categorical statements as if they're absolute facts and I'm going but that's not right yeah so yeah. it's very difficult as the parent to kind of be feel assertive enough to stand up against the expert because we have a tendency to trust the expertise I just saw a comment coming in there from a recent graduate and yes Alva it is changing and as you say your the graduates are now like leading the way in terms of okay. changing practice and Thank I should you. say, Michal, as well, sorry, I'm very happy if anyone wants me to come and talk to parents, delighted to do it, um, oh, absolutely. about kind of oh, putting oh, those oh, myths oh. to bed. Oh, believe me now, certainly with the online, I will be yeah. talking to Gurmila Mahaga. Gurmila Mahaga to um, we have another part. There's a lot of questions and comments. Uh, Anna um, Bachkowska has a, has a comment. Oh, I shouldn't have said your name, Anna, without your, without your um, permission. I apologise. Maybe you're happy to be identified anyway go ahead thank you very much for this interesting talk uh, i was just wondering if you have um, any sound is very low indeed and i'm not sure um, if your microphone is working properly um, okay how about now that's a lot better oh yeah that's better yeah yeah okay so thank you very much for your interesting talk um i enjoyed it a lot especially when i have a bilingual child myself and, wonderful um, yes i was just wondering uh, of the social aspect have you perhaps investigated or are you going to investigate the problem of social pressure in particular teachers and peer pressure uh, because you know uh, bilingual children multilingual children even more i suppose uh, have might have problems this is what um, i experienced in poland maybe it's not the case of other countries where there are many immigrants uh, like uk or perhaps Ireland as well but in poland this is quite a problem that uh, you know, peers do not always find it as an asset that somebody speaks another language. The children are perceived as some strange, different, uh, you know, the children feel subdued. Sometimes they don't want to speak English or they don't want to speak at all because they don't know which language to speak or uh, even, you know, the, the teachers are not always for it, you know. So yeah. they feel like they stand out, not always in the crowd, not always in the positive way. And, um, I think that bilingual children, at least in Poland and countries like us, uh, where there are not many bilingual uh, people, um, like children, bilingual children, it is a kind of a peer pressure that is um, quite against them, you know. So, okay, that's it. Absolutely, Anna. Thank um, oh. So, uh, yeah, I was in Warsaw actually last year for a week on oh. holidays. Loved it. And the um, podge gave my favourite food. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's to answer your advice as well. Oh yeah. <laughs> I I love, love, but it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Um so sorry now to answer your question. Um I have last year I did have two students who interviewed teachers about their experiences of you know having multilingual children in the classroom. So that is a topic that we are going to explore because again, as you say, like anecdotally you do hear like stories and then so like beyond that's kind of really the limits of what I've done in relation to that research I know Francesca Lamorchia of Mother Tongues has the language explorers book which is used in schools to kind of create you know cultural awareness in um with children around different languages and kind of um do that um but I agree it is like an ongoing problem I suppose you know, for me, it's not within the remit of my job as a speech and language therapist. So I, like, I wouldn't feel like qualified to go down the route of kind of exploring like identity or that kind of thing. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it, yeah, as I say, it's a question of identity. You're right. Yeah. Yeah, and that there are uh, there are other people obviously are researching like identity. And actually, I came across a lovely paper recently called. Um, red is the color and it's about it was a study of um they're called language portraits and people might know about these already where it's like a silhouette of the person and there's a conversation with the child where they color in different parts of the of the body to represent the different languages and their kind of proficiency in the different languages and it was a really lovely way to converse with the child about their feelings about being multilingual that's certainly a research project i'd love to replicate um so again i think other people are probably more qualified to answer your question than i am i just see a comment there from cassie about um okay. adolescence thank you very much okay thank you oh there's a, there's a lot of comments here just to get through some of them um okay. 
Kau na chafu in nail tocht co hex changa vionlig nor ton hoike mark he changa on valia. Ain nodona la shallavo na mion changa a freshu. Any um, hints about um, uh, acquisition of minority languages in nodona la shallavo na mion changa a freshu? Oh, take him. Okay, so I suppose the thing is really that the minority languages are the home language is under pressure because if it exists in an environment where, you know, it's in the minority so that it needs intensive support and from the speech and language therapy point of view if there is you know a speech and language issue then the therapy needs to take both of the languages into consideration and intensively support the home language the good news in a way about that is that like any of the practices that really enrich language um are really about how you do what you do um so for example if we think about reading together the trick for the reading together is using things like wordless picture books. So if you have difficulty getting access to books in your minority language, wordless picture books are a good idea. Uh, and there's the Lampedusa project. If you Google that, they have a list of books and the libraries actually have great silent books they're called or uh, wordless picture books. And the idea is that you use the book as a prop for conversation. Actually, if you want to go to the website and, and download the ebook about the how to make them love your language, I think it's called, that has like 26 different ideas for how to support the minority language. So it's about, you know, creating, I suppose, uh, the need for it and a positive attitude towards it. And I suppose thinking about what you have control over and what you don't. So the reading together, if we're talking about young children reading together, um, having conversations about the book, singing songs together, they are activities that are naturally monolingual. If you want to keep the focus on the minority language, um, cooking together, going shopping together, talking about the shopping. So there, those everyday like interactions, it doesn't necessarily need to be anything particularly fancy. And I know Cassie is in here, so she might have more kind of tips for you around that. But it's a long haul kind of a process, really. Um, and it can be dispiriting at times because you've no control over like what your child says or how they respond to you. Um, you only have control, I suppose, over what you do and what language you use and your own consistency um, with it. So you can, uh, the book is there with the 26 ideas. So hopefully that will help you. Okay, Garamila Mahakot Aharacha Asangeshchen. Um, have you any forum for your audience, as in parents of bilingual families, where they can contribute to and influence your work? For instance, choosing blog topics. Can parents author or co-author a blog? Oh, fantastic question. So yes, on the if you go to the website, there is a contact form and people can contact me there. And I would absolutely love to do that more collaborative. Um, like where my ideas come for the post are often from questions people have asked me. So for example, a, a woman asked me about her child. There was a query, did she have selective mutism? I said, I don't know what the literature says, but if you're happy for me to bring it together, I can do that. Um, so delighted to do that. You can email me at marypat at talknua.com or you can fill out the contact um, form on the website. Um, I'd love to do that actually, it would be great. Okay, very good. Another comment here, Jim Cummins uses a very useful an analogy of an iceberg to illustrate the common language proficiency that a multilingual child has shared between two or more languages. Another comment here from an SLT who graduated last year can confirm that newer therapists are leading the change of mindset on the ground and in the clinic and more experienced okay. therapists are happy to hear about emerging research. Mary Pat, August Michal, Harava, Simeon, some other links that are uh, posted there. Um, Cassie Smith Christmas has also posted uh, an interesting resource in relation to um, Polish adolescence and language there. I think that must be Brilliant. Gosh's new book. And um, yes, to another question, a question here that somebody has to leave. We will be making a recording of this available. It will be available on Facebook and uh, in, in a few days time, there'll be a video on YouTube and we'll have audio on SoundCloud. And I see that David has uh, answered that already. So thanks very much, David. And I think, I think that's it. I'm perhaps, uh, apologies if I've missed anybody. If anybody else wants to come in, there's a question in the Q&A as well from somebody saying that she was one of the brainwashed NUIG students a while back. <laughs> Thank you, Mary Pat, it's been so useful. So maybe we've time for one more question because it is a quarter to seven and we did promise to keep these sessions short. And Mary Pat has been on her feet metaphorically for three quarters of an hour now. So any final question from anybody? 
um, in relation to uh, Mary Pat's talk this evening. No more questions? Very good. Well, I think we had a great session and lots of interaction, both in terms of your pictures, Mary Pat, and in terms of the audience. So I'm very grateful again to Mary Pat O'Malley, Gurmila Market, Mary Pat, very interesting work indeed. And um, at talknua.com is the blog. And thanks to Dan Carey and to David Kelly of the Moore Institute, just to remind you that our next CAM uh, seminar in December will be presented by John McRae from NUI Galway, uh, entitled Artificial Intelligence Approaches to Multilinguality. And that's on Thursday again, the 10th of December at this time at 6 p.m. And we'll be sending out inf information about that in due course. So that's all. Gormila Mahagavarfad, Agus Gadeshiv Slong.